at St. John's, I used to take a series of lectures on the history of medicine. And whenever I started my first lecture and I told the students that this was going to be on the history of medicine, there was inevitably a loud groan because students had, had always thought that they left history behind when they left their 10th standard. And uh, I think in part it is because of the way we learn history because uh, it's, all, it's almost seen as something that doesn't belong to us. Uh, and what I hope to do in the next, uh, in, the, in this session, is actually to give you a glimpse of some of the lessons that I have learned from the history of medicine. And these are just very few of the many lessons that one can learn. The first question that we might want to ask is, when we talk about history, whose story? And uh, this is a relevant question because history is constantly being revised. And if you all have been part of the debates that are going on, you all will realize that there's always a fight about who's, uh, whether this history has a bias, have we not dealt with certain people or certain events adequately. And we might, be, might, we might even give in to this, what I think, is a very cynical view of Mark Twain, who said the very ink with which history is written is fluid prejudice. Now what I want to suggest to you is that there are many things we can still learn, although we might differ on whether we agree on how history is written. One of the things that I learned early by, 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 by embedding myself in the history of medicine was that one should always retain one's curiosity. And being a physiologist, I, I don't know which years you're lying, but uh, regardless of that, you would have come across this man very early in your, in your course. There are many things which we can gain from this photograph. One is that we will inv invariably age and change if we live, all right? But this is the picture of a man called Alan Hodgkin whom students hate because you have to know the ionic basis of the action potential. And if you want to blame anyone, blame him, all right? Because he discovered it. Uh, but what you might not know is that Alan Hodgkin lost his father when he was four years old. He had a younger brother who was two years old. He had a still younger brother who was one month. His mother couldn't handle them, so she used to palm them off to an aunt who was a very strange person, but who left, let the boys do what they wanted. And she encouraged Alan Hodgkin to, uh, to go out into the, into the scrub uh, that was around the house and start identifying birds. And you might wonder, what has birds got to do with this? Remember, Alan Hodgkin won the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Uh, well, in his own autobiography, he writes, it was those early years when he was doing something completely different, searching for birds, look, searching for their nests. And in the process, his aunt even challenged him to find the nest of a very elusive bird, the golden plover. And he, he took him two years to do that. In the process, he built his natural curiosity grew. And I think there is an important reason why we should retain our curiosity. All too often in medicine, we kill it, right? We tell you, this is the answer, that's it, and don't question me. And we shouldn't be doing that, and you shouldn't ever succumb to that. Because curiosity keeps building up your mind. And one of the greatest scientists of France, when asked, uh, you know, why is it that people discover things? And there's so many things which are discovered just by chance. Well, Louis Pasteur would say, in the field of observation, chance favors the prepared mind. And our curiosity is built, builds up that prepared mind. Another thing that I learned from the history of medicine is about having patience and perseverance. Let me continue with the story of Alan Hodgkin, the man you all hate so much, all right? Well, he, even as a physiologist, and I'm not that old, but when I had to do my early experiments, I had to build my own instruments. 
You didn't go to Amazon and order it, all right? And Alan Hodgkin belonged to an entire generation earlier where he had to start building things from scratch. So when he decided that he wanted to record the electrical activity of a nerve, he had to source out all his material on his own. He built several sets of, of uh, instruments. And then in 1939, he made this re famous recording of the action potential by inserting an electrode right in the center of a giant nerve, the giant squid neuron. And it was a really eureka moment because at that time, everyone believed that the nerve impulse was chemical, not electrical. And you would think that having demonstrated this, he published a paper, paper in Nature, which is arguably one of the highest ranked journals of all time. He, World War II broke out. Hitler invaded Poland. World War II was declared. And like many other scientists in Britain, Alan Hodgkin had to give up his studies and literally go to war. Well, he didn't fight the war, but like a lot of other scientists, he helped with the war effort. He started developing radar for the, for the British. Remember, this was a time when the Germans were carpet bombing Britain in the Battle of, uh, during the Battle of Britain, when they sent bombers at night, London was in flames. Uh, aircraft were being, fighters were being built to fly higher. But as they flew higher, pilots suffered from hypoxia. They needed to develop oxygen masks to deal with that. These were the sort of things that Alan Hodgkin did. While all at the back of his mind, you can imagine, he was thinking about this experiment he had let go. At the end of the war, he went back to his laboratory to find that the German bombers had actually destroyed the lab and his equipment that he had built could no longer be used. And so he built it up again. And then after doing a whole set of experiments, he had to process his results in the Cambridge computer, which was something like that and which worked at a speed that is far less than the phones that we carry, right? And he had to book his time on that computer. How long did it take after his first paper to publish the ionic basis of uh, the action potential? It took him 13 years, 13 years. And in the process of writing this paper, which you see here on the left, Today, that paper has been cited over 26 times, 1,000 times. That means people have referred to this paper 26,000 times. Now, just to put it in perspective, if I do research and 100 people cite my paper, I'm going to be very chuffed. I'll feel I'm on top of the world. This is not 100. This is not 1,000. This is 26,000. You can imagine the impact of this paper. One of the things that I learned also from the history of medicine is that we can be consumed by hubris. That hubris is immense pride. Pride which is so, so large that it's out of proportion to what we did or what we've done. We just feel so that we're so great. And unfortunately, history has been littered with these sort of people who have done remarkable work, but have, uh, in the process, demonstrated this immense pride. This is uh, the story. I know how many of you all have entered community health and know about Ronald Ross. But Ronald Ross was examining the origins of malaria. And at one point in time, after many years, he was a great writer. And if you ever read his autobiography, he has the ability to take you along as he works and he he you can't help but think he exaggerates his his fatigue and everything else that he feels as he goes through it but when he discovers the malarial parasite the mosquito he he pens this poem and this poem is this only a part of it with tears and toiling breath he's talking about himself I find thy cunning seeds, the parasite, O million murdering death. I know this little thing a myriad men will save. O death, where is thy sting? 
thy victory or grave. He had thought that he had solved the problem of malaria. Of course, he didn't. But this hubris or this immense pride, and he was a very proud man, uh, can, can result in many things. He was awarded the Nobel Prize. He was born in India. He was born in India in the year of the first war of independence in 1857. But what very few people know is that he actually started working on this malarial parasite uh, in mosquitoes because of the man on the on the side who very few people realize played an immense role in this discovery. And this is Patrick Manson. He is believed he is now revered as the father of tropical medicine. He was responsible for identifying the role of, of uh, uh, the origins of filariasis. And in fact, there was a whole move that Patrick Manson, Ronald Ross, and another man called Laveran, who, who worked on yellow fever, should jointly be given the Nobel Prize. But Ronald Ross never acknowledged Patrick Manson publicly. Although if you look at his letters which he writes, sometimes you feel, gosh, he writes to Patrick Manson and he says, I'm giving up, I can't do this. And Patrick Manson actually tells him sometimes what is true, you're probably dissecting the wrong mosquito because actually he was, he was looking at the wrong mosquitoes. And he would encourage him and say, if you don't do it, the Italians will find out before you do. And then, of course, Ronald Ross would continue with his work. When he won the Nobel Prize, he did not acknowledge Patrick Manson at all. And we see this being reflected in many other situations. I don't know whether you'll read Best and Taylor in physiology any longer, but the old editions of Best and Taylor always had on the front page a picture of Best, Charles Best, banting and a dog, because that was the discovery of the use of insulin in diabetes. Charles Best was then a medical student. He did this while he was a medical student. So, they, so that's encouragement for you all too. But once insulin was discovered, what happened? A whole lot of fighting over who should get credit. So when the Nobel Committee finally awarded the Nobel Prize to Banting, and next to him, McLeod, who was the head of the lab and a chemist who was actually working on the structure of insulin, Banting, Banting went berserk. He said, McLeod shouldn't get it, Charles Best should get it. So I'm going to share half my prize with Charles Best. And McLeod said, well, the chemistry is as important, and I'm going to share half my prize with Collip, who worked with him to, to look at the structure of insulin. It tells us that all too often when we look at the history of medicine, we only remember those people and who are the people at the top, forgetting that there are a lot of things which happened before that. For instance, did we know that actually the islets of, the, of Langerhans were discovered by Langhans when he was still a medical student. And this predated all this work by over half a century. Did we know that for over 30 years before they started working, two Germans actually demonstrated the role of the endocrine pancreas. So the history of medicine tells us that there is more than just the headlines that we ascribe to events. And in as much as there is hubris, there is also humility. And I point out this man, Ambaz Pare, because he was a barber surgeon at a time when surgeons were not recognized as being part of the medical profession because it was a dirty business. It was manual. Physicians were all learned in Europe at that time. They went to university. They went and uh, they studied logic. They studied Latin. They studied German. They studied everything but medicine, actually and they became the learned physicians. And surgeons were barbers. They, they cut your hair, they removed your teeth, they lanced your wounds. And Ambrose Paré was a barber surgeon in the, in the army of the King of France. And one day, when the battles were going on, the way they stopped the bleeding was to pour hot oil over the bleeding wound because that cauterized the wound. 
And it was a, a terrible procedure because, of course, people were screaming, they were bleeding. And inevitably, after two days, the, the wound, uh, there would be pus that formed. And for a long time, people thought pus was a part of natural healing. One day, when Ambrose Pare was working in the, in the battlefield, the hot oil ran out. And he did not know what to do because he had been trained that you have to pour hot oil. And then he does something remarkable. Two things, in fact. The first is, he decides to stop the bleeding with compression and apply a salve or, a, or a, a dressing made of honey and oil and something else, not hot oil. And then he also discovers, rediscovers the use of the ligature to stop the bleeding. And the first time he does not do the cauterization, he goes to his room and he's a deeply religious man. He goes to his own tent, sorry. And then when he's there, he actually prays and he says, I hope I have not killed the man by not cauterizing the wound. The next morning when he goes to the tent, he finds the man he's treated without cauterization, sleeping very soundly. Everyone else is in pain and he thought, I've killed him, surely. But no, he isn't. And he recovers. And when he's asked how you heal the man, these famous words, I dressed the wound and God healed it. I think that was a real lesson in humility. We've all gone through difficult times. The pandemic has thrown its own challenges. We all have difficulties during our course, in our families, in the people we know. And adversity is a huge issue. But let me take you through two quick stories. The first is a story of a woman whom I cannot read enough about. In 1922, a fascist in Italy called Benito Mussolini, whom you see here alongside Hitler, seized power in Italy. And like how Hitler, after 1933, started acting against the Jews in Germany, Benito Mussolini soon followed suit. By about 1936, 37, he had passed laws, and those laws came into force in 1938, where Jews in Italy were forced to leave colleges and schools. They were not allowed to have university jobs. They could not even own a radio set because he was worried that they would hear something that was different from what he was actually providing to them, to, for the whole public to hear. Because of these issues, a young girl at that time, she's a lot older, she lives to beyond 100, finally, but then a 30-year-old young girl, Rita Levi Montalcini, is thrown out of university. She has been working on the development of nerve cells. Her field is neuroembryology. And she's, this is at a time when nerves were being described in great detail after the discoveries of Golgi and uh, who, who discovered the staining and Kahal who studied the staining of, of nerves. And she's looking at these nerves and seeing how they branch, how they grow in chick embryos, in eggs, all right? And suddenly she's told, out you go out of the university. And so she leaves the university and she goes to her own house and uh, she decides, she's a medical doctor, she says, I will practice medicine. And she goes to help the Jews who were found themselves diffident. They didn't want to go and see other doctors because they were being victimized. But she had a problem. She could diagnose as a doctor, she could advise as a doctor, but Mussolini said, Jews cannot write prescriptions. And so she's really at her lowest state when one of her friends tells her, why do you want to be cowed down by this? Remember Ramon Cajal, who won the Nobel Prize in describing those nerves. He worked in Valencia, in Spain, uh, an academic backwater. No one, no great university in Valencia. But in his small room, he developed the tools to study these nerves and stain them. 
And that's exactly what she does. She goes to her bedroom. She goes to the butcher. She goes to the grocer. She gets a knife from the butcher. She gets the eggs from the grocers. And she literally sets up a lab in her own bedroom. And over the entire war years, she starts working that way. By the time she has finished her work and the World War is over, 1945-46, she's on to something new because she realizes that there are some factors which control nerves. She goes on to discover, together with her, another colleague of her, Stanley uh, Cohen, the nerve growth factor. Sound familiar? Nerve growth factor, epidermal growth factor, platelet-derived growth factors. The, all these growth factors grew after her discovery. She had three things going against her. She was a woman. Being a woman at that time was terrible because no one wanted you to go to university in the first place. She had to fight to go to university. The second, she was a Jew. And Jews were completely uh, dissuaded, were put, put aside in society. And the third was, <coughs> she was something. No, I have lots of things. She had something which women never did. She was a scientist. Who ever heard of women scientists? She goes on 40 years later to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1986. And if you ever get a chance to read her story, you know, there are far more girls in medicine today than boys. And you, perhaps, as I will tell you later, it's a legacy which we should understand was fought for. It did not come easily. And so in her own autobiography, this is what she says. I should thank Mussolini for having declared me to be of an inferior race. This led me to the joy of working. Not anymore, unfortunately, in university institutes, but in a bedroom. I'm going to tell you about another man. Do you all know this man? No, not Robert. Okay, he's a man who studied here in Madras, in Madras Medical College, all right? And he is credited with not one discovery, but several discoveries. Any, any, any guesses now? This man is Yela Pragada Subarao. If you haven't heard of him, go and read. This is a remarkable story. And this is a man, a boy, who at 13, born in a small village in Andhra Pradesh, decides that he's had enough of learning, there's not much he can do in school anyway, and he runs away to Banaras or Varanasi, and he thought, I'll sell plantains there and I'll become rich. He was, he was today's modern day entrepreneur. And his mother goes there, drags him back, and gets, puts him into school. He fails his matriculation. His mother sells her only gold bangle, and then he goes and sits the second time. He passes his matriculation. He comes here to Madras. And in Madras, he goes and joins the Ramakrishna mission because he's, he, ha he wants to do philosophy. And the monks there realize that there's a lot more to him. And they tell him, go and do medicine. That may be your calling. And so he comes to Madras Medical College after doing his intermediate and presidency college. And then he joins medicine. And it's the time of the freedom movement. So he insists on wearing khadi. So much so that his British professor of surgery fails him in his final exam. And so when he passes out of Madras Medical College, he's not awarded an MBBS. He's awarded the LMS, Licentiate in Medical Medicine and Surgery, which is a lower degree. So he can't get jobs. So he joins the Ayurvedic Medical College in, in Madras, which I believe no longer exists in its present form. And it, while he's there, he goes on and writes this huge book on Ayurvedic medications. And if, um, he's here on the extreme left in the front row. All right. And then he goes back to his village and he decides he wants to do the diploma in tropical medicine from Harvard. He gets married. His, he has a child bride of 12 years 
and he leaves her. He writes to Harvard and he says, and he writes very grandly because his father-in-law says, I will pay for you. He writes, I won't need any money. And he goes to Harvard. And then he is admitted into Harvard uh, course for the tropical medicine. And it is there that he realizes that it costs far more the money than he has. And so he's forced to work as a night porter. Even as he leaves Madras and he travels on the SS Kashgar, he writes to his father, my dear father-in-law, tomorrow I will reach Aden where we stay for a few hours. Then he goes on to complain and he says, I am the only vegetarian on board. I am living on eggs, boiled potatoes, peas, cabbages, coffee, bread and butter, which for him was a terrible thing to be, to be doing, understandably. And he goes on to say how all the other the uh, passengers and crew were eating very grandly, all right? When he goes to, to Harvard and he realizes he cannot afford it, he approaches Harvard, and he, uh, the people in Harvard, and they then write this letter where he says, he's finding the cost of living in this country much higher than he anticipated. I understand that he finds himself for the first year temporarily financially embarrassed. So, He's given a job to work in the biochemistry lab. He has never done biochemistry. But then he, he goes and works in biochemistry. And in the interim, he's also a porter, all right? And he's doing all these menial tasks. And while he's there, he sees all these great professors in Harvard, Cushing, right? Cushing's disease, Cushing syndrome. They all walk past him. But he's the porter, all right, who's there at that time. So in biochemistry, he finally finds his calling. He realizes his mind works in such a remarkable way. And everyone in Harvard is amazed at him in that lab because he, in his area where he's working, he's got about eight experiments going on simultaneously. And he's able to look after all eight of them and tell you exactly what's going to happen. And he publishes this, this uh, paper which, as on yesterday, had 25,900 citations. All right? Remember 100 and we feel very good. All right? This is Subarao. Sadly, he dies at the age of 53. And he never wins the Nobel Prize. But there are a lot because the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously. You cannot be dead and receive the Nobel Prize. But there are enough people who feel that, they, that the world missed recognizing him. And Harvard did not recognize him either. They could not give him a permanent job because he was classified as an alien. He had to carry an alien card. And instead he goes and joins Liddell, which is a pharmaceutical company, and he makes all those discoveries. And you can see here, they are even a uh, fungi named after him, all right? And people, till today, I have met professors in Harvard who say we did something very wrong and we lost a lot by doing that because they did not give him a job. History tells us that we can learn from the past. Look at these diagrams, all black and white, doom, despair, right? This is the height of the Industrial Revolution. London is a city that, that was built on industry, but it never saw the sun. In fact, there was something that people called the, the big smoke because the sky was just covered with smoke. And if any of you all have seen the movie, and you may not have, called Mary Poppins, there are a lot of ch chimneys spewing out smoke and, and the entire sky is, is black. What did happen to people? People died because of that smoke. And the rich people just kept shifting their houses from the center further and further away. It, the, the Industrial Revolution saw the birth of slums like were never seen before. Child labor. Child labor was used in all the spinning mills and cotton mills of Manchester because these children could go in between the machines to check for broken threads, which had occurred during, which happened while the, the cloth was being made. 
the rivers of, of industrial cities were completely polluted as shown by this cartoon in Punch, which, which basically depicted the river as a death itself. Why am I telling you about this? Because if you all have reached pharmacology and you all have done pharmacology, you all would come across something called this hierarchy of evidence. And in this hierarchy of evidence, we have all sorts of study designs. And you know, we say some are very good and some are not so good. And yet, a lot of the lessons that we already know don't come from any of these. And I want you to focus on this to illustrate that. This is something which in community health they would love to tell you about. And that is this, what you see on this graph is the deaths related to tuberculosis. If you look at the deaths related to tuberculosis, you will find that around 1850, which is right at the start of the graph and somewhere here, deaths due to tuberculosis were very high. And then look how it, it falls so dramatically. During the World War I, there is no change. Again, it falls between World War I and World War II. When were the antibiotics introduced for tuberculosis? Much later, after Second World War. When was BCG vaccine introduced as a mass program? Much later. Then what was this huge decline due to? The decline was due to urban laws societal change as doctors we like to put ourselves on a pedestal and we believe that we have brought about the greatest change in public health we have not society has civil society has fought the battle where doctors have failed and so you see that during the the 1850s and 1860s a lot of these laws were put into place and because people were living better, they were getting better nourished, they were working under better conditions, all these death rates fell. And this was, this was true not only for England, you go to any city in Europe which will introduce these and you will find this dramatic fall again. So history tells us that there is more than treatment and pharmaceuticals which change health. And one of the things that I have a problem with is that nowhere in our pyramid do we include historical evidence. And there's no need to repeat these examples. The Great Plague, which killed nearly 40% of Europe, introduced quarantine. And in the cities of Italy, which were affected, you have these writings of great writers like Boccaccio at that time, which tell you that when plague broke out, then the carts came to take away the baggage. Too late. Look at our cities today. India has not been immune to plague. In the 1990s, we had plague breaking out in Surat and in Bhid districts of Maharashtra. And when that happened, I recall people suddenly being petrified. Why? Because it, from Surat, everyone left Surat. And if everyone wondered how fast will it spread everywhere else, we know the lessons that we need to learn and history provides us with those lessons. History do does not repeat itself because we do not learn. It repeats itself because we do not change. We must keep in mind also that medicine is not an isolated subject. We learn from other subjects. This is about a disease called Kuru, right? This disease was sometimes called the laughing death because people's faces were in rictus, as though in a perfect smile, but there was nothing to smile about. It was identified in the beginning of the 20th century in a region of Papua New Guinea. And it was a death which only affected the men. Largely, you'll see some deaths in women here as well, but largely men. Why? Because these men, as part of the respect that they paid to their dead, indulged in ritualistic cannibalism. 
where they ate a part of the brain of the dead person. Now this was a start of an investigation where this man, Guy Dussek, would ultimately look to the cause, he would describe slow viruses, and he would win the Nobel Prize for it. But his work would never have succeeded if before him, people who were unrelated to medicine, these husband and wife team, Catherine and Ronald Burnt, who were Australian anthropologists, who actually went to Papua New Guinea, lived among the tribes and described the whole processes because if, and the rituals, because if they hadn't done that, Carlton Gaidusek would never have even thought of going there to try and investigate this disease. All too often, we live within the medical silo. And there are a lot of things we should and ought to be learning from people around us. History tells us that people can be humiliated. This man here, I don't know how many of you all will recognize him, but in the early 1980s, he went to the largest gathering of scientists in America and he proposed a new theory of disease. In the evening, there was a magazine at that conference which came out for, for everyone. And in that magazine, this limerick was constructed about this man. There was a young Turk named Stan who embarked on a devious plan. If I simply rename it, I'm sure I can claim it, said Stan as he pondered his scam. Eureka, cried Stan, I have found it. Well, maybe not actually found it, but I talked to the press of the slow virus mess and invented a name to confound it. That evening, the students who were working in his lab started leaving him in droves. They said, if we continue with this man, people are going to target us and we're young. The rest of our lives are going to be affected. Well, this man continued to work on this. In 82, he had proposed the prion theory of disease. And in 1997, he won the Nobel Prize for it. He was humiliated, but finally vindicated. Not everyone suffers that fate, or not everyone has that good effect, finally. This man is, of course, Ignaz Semmelweis, who introduced hand washing and in the process helped to con control what many historians call the doctor's plague, because the doctors were responsible for the deaths of patients. Doctors didn't wash their hands because they believed the death, disease was transmitted through the air by miasma. And why would you wash your hands? In fact, surgeons were often thought to be great if on their coats there were more blood stains, which they wiped on their coats. So he describes hand washing, he brings down mortality in his wards, but finally what happens? He is a difficult man and he accuses doctors of being murderers and everything else. And the support that he might have found was lost because of his lack of being able to be politically correct, perhaps. And so he's finally put into a mental health asylum. The guards beat him, and he dies of sepsis, the very disease that he described in Women in Childbirth. I'm going to end with something, well, with something which I feel strongly about, and I'm sure you all will too, be too. And this is the glass ceilings. History tells us the glass ceilings are meant to be broken. Women healers were always there in the world. For in ancient times, women were the healers. In ancient Greece, when the wars between the cities were fought and people took slaves, they searched for women because they were the healers. In ancient Egypt, they, they were healers. They are, they are depicted on the walls of temples. But in the Middle Ages in Europe, these doctors, which who were midwives, nurses, and they were the doctors to the poor. They, they, they treated everyone. They were, de they were depicted by the learned physician as quacks, as witches, and as maids. They were told that they, they couldn't, they were not scientific. And so 
we went into a phase where women were gradually removed. And when universities came into being, women were not part of that education. And when medical school started, women were not part of that education either. This is the story of James Miranda Stewart Barry. He went on to become one of the highest ranking medical officers in the British Army. And this is a thesis that he wrote as part of his, uh, of his training. When he died, his maid went in to bathe his body for the funeral and came out screaming because James Miranda Stewart Barry was not a man. James Miranda Stewart Barry had been born Margaret Ann Bulkley, and she went through an education disguised as a man and lived her life because that was the only way she could actually become a doctor. But in the process, she proved many things. She proved one, women were not less capable than men. They could function in a most male-dominated environment, the British Army. And she proved that other women could do it as well. And later on, we come across this first woman who actually gets trained as a doctor publicly. But the story of how she became a doctor is not often known. She was a teacher. She decided one of her close friends, women, died of cervical cancer. And she tells that woman when she's dying say, says to her, if there was a woman doctor, I would not have been in this state. And Elizabeth Blackwell is just completely taken aback with that. She says, I must become a doctor. And she goes to every medical school in America and everyone refuses her entry because no one will, will not. Women as nurses, fine. Women as doctors, certainly not. And so she goes into a country medical school. And in the country medical school, she meets the administrators. And the administrators, I don't know why they did it, but at that time, they suddenly felt, we shouldn't overtly tell her you're not allowed to enter. So we'll find a way to refuse her. Now, in the medical school, there were 150 boisterous, and completely unruly male medical students. So the administrators go to them and tell them, see, there's this woman who wants to become a doctor. And do you all really want her to be there? And the students actually tell them, why don't you all go out? We'll discuss it among ourselves. And they shut the door, discuss it among themselves, and five minutes later say, yes, we are OK. She can come in. <laughs> and so. She joins the medical school, and the administrators can't do anything about it. She tops her class, and she comes out, and no one will offer her a job. And so she goes to Europe, in France, and works as a nurse to hone her clinical skills. And she finally goes to England, sets up her own, uh, her own uh, clinic. And what, while she's going through this, remember this is a sole woman, one woman in an entire system of men. And she talks about it. She says, why did you do it? And she said, for what is done or learned by one class of women becomes by virtue their common womanhood, the property of all women. And she was willing to stake her life as she lived it on that. There's a story that a man came to her in a carriage and a note came to her, written note. He didn't get out of the carriage. And he just said, I have the gout. Do you treat it? And the reply is, gout is very much in my line. You, sir, are not. Because although she was a doctor, the line was very clear. She would not be allowed to treat men. And through this whole process, she writes about how a lonely path is to be a pioneer. It, today we can look at it and say, oh, how wonderful. But her life was really one of loneliness because there was no one she could share all that she was going through with. Much later, in, 19, in 1850, the first women's medical college was started in Pennsylvania in America. In 1902, look, 50 years later, in Ireland, this is what the 
the male students write in their student magazine about the girls entering their medical school. They say, though all the world's a stage and we are acting, yet still I think your part is not dissecting. To me, the art of making apple tarts would suit you better than those horrid parts. At times to come, when queens at home you are, there'll be more rapture in the light guitar. Your knowledge of the frog should only be how they are cooked in France or making tea. And as for learning chemistry, and that would be nicer thing to trim a hat. I know your aims in medicine are true, but tell me, is there any need of you? This is about as patronizing as it could get. And that was what women had to fight if they had to be in medical school. Our native Indian doctors have had to fight the same battle. You have Anandi Bhai Joshi at the top who studies in the Women's Medical College in Pennsylvania. She has to cross the ocean. She is a, of, of high caste and crossing the ocean was a huge thing. She knew people asked her, why do you ever want to do something like that? She comes home and she dies of tuberculosis. She never practices. We have Kadambini Ganguly, who is the first woman who goes to Calcutta Medical College. And that's a struggle because she's told you have to have a degree. and There's no college where she can get a degree before she joins medicine. So they have to fight for the college to be started to allow her to do the degree. And of course, last but not least, you're all familiar with Muthulakshmi Reddy, right? And each of these are long stories. If you really are interested in them, you should know that Anandi Bhai Joshi has a huge correspondence. If you ever read her letters, you will know what she went through. Putra Lakshmi Reddy writes her own autobiography and it's really worth reading it. We don't know much about Kandamini Ganguly, but we do know some of her compatriots. And all of these women had to prove themselves. The first thing that they were told is you're not capable. Well, Elizabeth Blackwell topped her class and Anne Wok, who was actually the first Indian in Grant Medical College in Bombay, she look at all that she had to do. So she proved that, that, that they were fully capable of doing that. The other thing that they had to fight, remember, Elizabeth Blackwell said she wouldn't treat men. When the British came to India, they started these lying in hospitals for women basically for women to go and give childbirth. It was the great colonial movement, you know, the white man's burden. They, they had to carry it to, to bring health to us. Actually, those lying in hospitals had very little effect on public health because they were very few and many, very few people used them. But one of the things that women had to fight for and women doctors was that they were told you only deal with women's problems. In other words, as far as the British were concerned, Women's problems were between the breasts and the knees. And there's this Dr. Hemavati Sen who sets up the hospital and goes out of her way to hire males in her hospital. And so the colonial rulers were most upset by that. They said, how can a woman have other men working under her? And she said, well, I'll hire who I want to hire. And she then goes on to show that all the problems of women are the same as men, except for their generative problems, all right? So a woman had to be treated as a whole being, and we might laugh at that today, but that was a fight that had to be made, that women weren't only about their reproductive health. I'm going to end with something which I think must be good news. We, there's so many things we've learned about the history of medicine, but I think one of the things which we must remember is that there's a lot in the history of medicine which inspires us. And if you'll ever get to decide at some point in your life that you want to specialize, I would urge you read about the, the people who made your field. There is no better way than to really immerse yourself in what you have chosen and to understand that what you're going through is a legacy of people who have gone before you. History tells us that, you know, during the COVID vaccinations, so many commercialized, so many pharmaceuticals, people making uh, and saying they are making money. Who got rich during the, the pandemic? The pharma companies got rich during the pandemic. 
Well, in the 1950s, the United States had its first, last major outbreak of polio. And it was very severe. Entire warehouses were converted into these type of arrangements where people who had bulbar poliomyelitis were put on what were called the iron lungs, which were basically respirators, ventilators. And there were some who were left on them for decades. Well, this spurred people to develop vaccines. And one of the vaccines that was developed was by this man, Jonas Salk. And Jonas Salk was asked because he developed the vaccine based on public money. People contributed money to develop the vaccine. And he was asked, who owns the, the vaccine? And he said, well, the people, I would say. In his case, it was true because the people had actually contributed money. And they said, but why won't you patent it? And he said, there is no patent. Could you patent the sun? And I think that's very important because if there is something that is so universally required by everyone, should we even be trying to patent something as that? And this raises the whole issue of the greater good. An individual may prosper, but how does the rest of the world benefit from that? And so I conclude, if I had to look at what I have learned from, from the history of medicine, there are just so many things. As a physiologist, I think my life would be quite incomplete if I never read the history of all those wonderful things that I later on choose, chose to investigate. As a postgraduate, we had a book called The Annual Review of Physiology, which used to come out every year. And one chapter at the beginning was devoted to the biography or the autobiography of one great physiologist. Sadly, they've given that up now. And I review this annual review and I keep writing and saying, where has this chapter gone? I think I have just given you a glimpse of what the history of medicine has taught me. And there is far, far more that you can learn. So I hope that as you leave today, maybe you will think about something that I've said. And maybe as you go through your course, you will begin to think about some of the lines in your book. You know, there are some things in your textbooks which are one line. And that one line is a lifetime of work, you know. And I think if we can remember that, I think even the way we learn becomes different. Because we realize that almost every line in our, in our books is laden with someone's effort. Thank you and thank you once again for having me here. Thank you very much, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure having you over here this afternoon. Uh, and uh, the insights you have given us were very, very motivating. In fact, some of these stories are so inspiring, they're still running in most of our minds. And we'll all definitely follow up on, on all the stories you've told us. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all uh, for attending this oration. And thank you to the Dean and for giving us this opportunity to host Dr. Mario Vargas. Uh, once again, thank you everybody for being here and 